dreams forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning. I'm Philip Bradley, minister of the Gunnersville Church of Christ, just down the road there in Gunnersville. Uh, Dr. Bradley is out of town for the next, uh, the next week, and it's always a privilege and an honor for me to be with you, not only this morning, but, but next Sunday as well. And it's hard to believe that the month of March is well underway, and and we hope and pray that you're uh, the beginning, at least, the early part of late winter, early spring. Hope that that's uh, been uneventful, but yet been rewarding as well. It's uh, not going to be too long before the uh, the spring breaks of our school systems, uh, you know, begin, and and it'll just I know how it is at our at our place. It just uh, kind of starts then, and it just just continues to snowball all the way into summer. And uh, schedules will pick up as the weather improves, hopefully, with uh, warmer weather and prettier weather. And there's just a a host of opportunities that uh, this part of the country really does uh, lend itself. But hopefully... Uh, your uh, situation is is uh, equally as as our as the opportunities there, and uh, with all that busyness, and uh, we mention this every broadcast, they'll through the course of our of our time together this morning, there will be an opportunity for you to enroll in World Bible School. During our broadcast, uh, there'll be operators there at the Mayfair Church that will take your phone call. And uh, not only if you'd like to enroll in World Bible School, but if, uh, if there's a particular need, a prayer request, something that uh, you believe that they could help you with, they'll be there not only through the broadcast, but even a few moments after we're off the air. Uh, if you'd like to go on their website, that web address will, uh, will be there as well. And you can uh, go to the World Bible School link and uh, they'll be glad to enroll you in a free Bible correspondence course. And I've said before, it's, it's, I think it's the very best, uh, the most uh, structured yet uh, time-honoring way for you to uh, uh, take an opportunity and systematically work through a study of the scriptures, and and that really is what this entire program has been uh, has been founded on, and that is, and if you if you pay attention as as, as I do to the opening uh, trailer for this program, uh, the emphasis that's always been placed on on a study of of God's word, and that we believe that the, the issues, the answers to to life's uh, challenges are found within the Word of God. And that's really what we want to do this morning. And if you have your Bible or if you have it on a device or something, I want you to be turning to the book of James. I know that in in previous weeks, uh, Dr. Bradley has been working his way through uh, various letters of, of Paul. And uh, what I wanted to do this morning and next week, uh, the Lord willing, is, is to spend our time in, in the book of James. And uh, we want to start in the first chapter this morning. So if you'll uh, be turning there, and while you're turning, uh, just a little bit of review. You know, when you go to, uh, to the Gospels and we read about the, uh, uh, the, the birth and, and the life of Jesus, there are some gaps, obviously. We read uh, Mark and excuse me, Matthew and and Luke both record his birth. Uh, You pick up Mark and John's Gospels, and and by the time you're well well into their narratives, uh, Jesus is already 30 uh, 30 years old and has begun his ministry. And so you go to Matthew and to Luke's Gospels, and they record his birth, and then there is that one instance, one incident when he's 12 years old, and then there's another gap from age 12 to age 30, and I, say, I think sometimes we forget the fact that Jesus was a part uh, of a real family. He had uh, his mother Mary, his earthly father Joseph, but he also had siblings. Uh, 
And there are references to his, his brothers especially. And uh, there are four of them that are listed in, in, the, in the Gospels, one of which, uh, one of whom is this, this uh, man named James who writes this letter that bears his name in, in the New Testament. The other, of course, is the short little uh, letter of Jude. And both of these men were brothers of Jesus. And the great irony is that during his ministry uh, on the earth, for that three-year ministry, they were not believers. They were not his disciples. In fact, uh, the, the Gospels record that on one occasion, James and his other brothers went to a house where Jesus was teaching, and uh, they tried to get him to admit that he was mentally unstable, uh, the Bible tells us, and actually wanted to uh, to take him and, and forcibly take him back to Nazareth because his, his message was so outlandish and his claims of deity were completely off the map that uh, they had come to the conclusion that it might be better if we just uh, tell everybody that, that he's you know, just kind of mentally off. Well, all that changed, if, is, as you very well know, on that one weekend after his death and his burial and on that resurrection, uh, where he, he uh, came back to life, and it, it's almost as if that's when the light switch came on. In fact, we read in the first chapter of the book of Acts that not only were the apostles gathered together there in that upper room, but it, it lists, you know, some others. So there was a, a total of 120, but it mentions his mother and his brothers were also there, which I think is an indication of of, uh, you know, the, the change that had taken place in their life. And, and, and the book of James, I think, is without a doubt one of the most practical in, in all the New Testament. And if, if you want to get a, a clear idea of, of the nuts and bolts of living the Christian life, then I think the book of James would be an excellent choice. And uh, as, we're, as we're, you know, turning to that first chapter, I, I always find it rather compelling that right out of the gate, right in that first verse, and, and I'll remind you as I do, uh, my students at, at Faulkner University or even uh, at, at home there in Gunnersville, that chapter and verse divisions are not original. Uh, they were a, a an advancement made by our translators to uh, help facilitate study and reading. And, uh, but when James wrote this letter, it was all in one block. He did not divide it up, you know, into, into those five chapters. But I find it compelling that right out of the gate in that first verse, he addresses himself as James, a servant of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that that's just such a humble statement because if I had been in his situation, I would have done a little bit of name dropping. I would have taken some, uh, some uh, homiletical license, if you will, and it would have reminded my uh, readers that, look, I was, I was one of the, or I am one of the, uh, the blood brothers of Jesus. But he doesn't do that. And I think that's an indication of, of how he had, ha had changed. And so he doesn't view himself as... Uh, the brother of Jesus. He views himself as uh, a servant. And uh, I think uh, the statements have, have been made that I think are, are accurate in this, that, that what the book of Proverbs is to the Old Testament, James is to the New Testament. Words of wisdom, practical principles that are to be applied in, in everyday life. And, uh, and I think the book of James is, is a, a testimony to that, that our beliefs, excuse me, our behavior is, is, is an outgrowth of our beliefs. And that's true for all of us. Uh, your conduct, your value system, your means of, of making decisions are, are all predicated by a, uh, a belief system. And, uh, and that's exactly what happens here. And James you know, begins by, by acknowledging that, look, a godly life doesn't begin in your behavior. It, it begins in your actions. That's where it really, you know, it really starts. And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to concentrate here in the first chapter. And uh, if we have time this morning, we'll go to the first 15 chapters. If not, then we'll, we'll pick up wherever we leave off uh, this morning and pick up here next Sunday. And uh, with one of the first things I want you to notice is, is James begins by talking about God's perspective, being able to look at things through that prism, being able to look at that through, through the eyes of God, if you will. And he begins, let's, let's just jump right in in verse 2, 
Uh, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, your translation may use the word patience there, which is, a, is, a, is an adequate uh, translation. I think that the difference is we have a, 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 a different concept of patience now, and there's a difference between patience and perseverance. So perseverance might be a better uh, a better uh, translation of that particular word here. He goes on, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And, and I find this rather, uh, a rather interesting way to begin this letter because he starts out by saying, uh, consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh, your translation may say different or diverse. And I'm so glad that he doesn't stipulate what kind of trial, what kind of test. And, and you may have turned on this program this morning. You began this week. You began this day still dealing with a particular test, still dealing with a particular challenge. And, and James says, you know, one of the first objectives in dealing with that is to try to look at it from God's perspective. Now, it doesn't mean that that trial or that challenge that you're going through uh, is, is not a big deal. Uh, and, and we wouldn't, for, for you know, not any reason in the world would we try to uh, uh, simplify or, or, you know, just kind of play down uh, the issues and the challenges in somebody's life. But what James is saying is God doesn't see trials and difficulties as something that are too big to overcome. You know, the reality of it is, yes, that challenge, that test is big, uh, but God is bigger. And, and it doesn't mean that, that those trials are going to somehow be easier for you as, as a Christian. I think that's one of the misnomers that, uh, or the impression or the perception that sometimes that, that we leave with people. And that is, hey, look, you know, you're, you're really under the gun, but if you become a Christian, all that vanishes. No, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't go away. Uh, one writer put it this way, for every unbeliever that gets cancer, there's a believer that gets cancer so that the world can see the difference. And, uh, and I think that's probably a more balanced approach to this. So it doesn't mean that, that your problems are not going to be as big. It doesn't mean that they're, that they're going to be any easier. But what it does mean is that, that God is going to provide a way for us to deal with this. You know, sometimes we're, we're, we're tempted to deal with challenges with uh, anger or frustration and even resentment. It, it could be uh, depression or, or, or desperation. But oftentimes, some of the, the arenas where God does some of His greatest work uh, are, are in the, uh, the areas that we're talking about here. So James says, consider it joy my brothers, when you face trials of, of many kinds. That word uh, of various kinds, uh, as I said a while ago, I'm so glad he doesn't, he doesn't specify. I think there are probably three different kinds of trials when we, when we really break this down. I could, you could probably add to that, but I, I'm going to put them in three categories uh, for our purposes this morning. The first would be this. Some trials that you go through are because of poor choices. You're, you're basically reaping what you've sown. Uh, you, goo off, you, know, you goof off during class and, and you skip class and then you don't study for a final and then uh, you, 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 know, you end up failing the class. Well, you know, that's because of a poor choice or, or you lose your job because you don't uh, follow through with what your, your uh, superiors are telling you to do. Well, that's going to happen. Uh, you, you sprain your ankle because you're texting while you're walking down the sidewalk and you miss the curb. You know, there, there are all kinds of, of examples that we could come up with. But the bottom line is, uh, if your trial is a result of, of, of a poor choice, well, there's really nobody else to blame. There's cause and effect. You just, you know, you're reaping the uh, effects of, of, you know, what you caused and, and that's one way we have, have trials. Uh, a second type, I think, would be spiritual, tri uh, spiritual trials. These are when God begins to use, and I want to be very clear about this, God doesn't generate them. God do is not the source of them. Uh, 
But God is going to use that trial to, to deepen you. And we'll, we'll, we see examples of this on into the second chapter. And uh, James gives us some illustrations of this. But, but the trial may come because of, of your faith and how that faith clashes with uh, oftentimes a very worldly culture. So as a result, you know, the, the stand that you take, the convictions that you employ uh, are going to fly counter to the world and you're going to sub be subjected uh, to ridicule. And, uh, you know, we deal with this all the time. The accusations, well, you know, you're out of touch with realities. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were, we were talking about the, uh, the credibility of the Bible and, and the, way, the various ways in which people respond uh, to, to uh, their exposure with the Bible. I like what Peter says in 1 Peter. You can jot down 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 where there Peter said, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much. I find it interesting that, that, that James says, Count it all joy. And, and here in verse 13, Peter says, Rejoice in as much as you participate and he qualifies it, in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. However, if you suffer as a, as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God to, that you bear that name. So, so there would be those, those spiritual trials. That's the second category. A third category, a third type, and I guess the best way to describe this would be uh, unexplained mystery. And you know the type I'm talking about. They just, they just have no reason. There is no logical explanation for this to be happening. You're just kind of left kind of scratching your head and wondering, you know, why is this happening? I, I don't understand it. And unfortunately, we see this all the time. It's, it's when the drunk driver in one reckless moment reduces the size of your family. Uh, it's when you go to the doctor and uh, uh, right in the midst of, of your pregnancy and the doctor says, I think there's a problem. And then, and then a few months later, uh, you know, there's, a, there's the birth of a, of a special needs child. It, it's when a promotion goes to another uh, a, a co-worker and, and yet 99% of the people all said the same thing. I thought it was yours. I thought you were going to get that job. You deserved it. You're the best qualified. And, and so, you know, these are the kind of things that we're talking about. That no, not everything, you know, not everything has a silver lining. Not every uh, uh, issue, not every challenge has a logical explanation. But someday they will. Someday from heaven's perspective, and this is what we're talking about, when from God's perspective, those type things uh, are, are a little bit clearer. And whether the trial makes sense or not, the solution is always the same, and that is we need Jesus, and, and God is the source of that strength. And so James begins by saying, you know, let, let's look at it from God's perspective. And, and secondly, he moves on to showing us how God can help. And so we have God's perspective. Now we see God's help. Look at, uh, at verse 5 through verse 8. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, well, I could kind of look around and say, well, yeah, that would, that would be me, and you would probably say that too. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the sea. That person should not expect to receive anything from God, but such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now we could spend the rest of our time this morning and even next week talking about what does James mean by this idea of being double-minded. Uh, you know, we, we could look at this on, on any number of fronts and uh, I think basically what James is talking about, it's when you try to think on one level and live on another. Uh, you can't do that. That's, that's being double-minded. And, uh, and so he says, look, God is willing to help with, with trials. He's willing to help with tests, but he's also willing to help in time of temptation. And that's usually, I think, where, we, where, we, where the battle is won or lost. We can accept 
you know, a test. We can, can go through trials. That, that's what's called living. But it's, it's when temptation comes along and, and we find ourselves repeatedly lapsing into the same issue, the same problems, the same addictions, the same things that always kind of kind of really have a, have a negative result. Look at verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. Evidently, some of the people that, that James is writing to in its original uh, uh, content, he's writing to people who were prone to blame God for a lot of their problems. Well, that's, that's still around, isn't it? We think, well, God is tempting me. God is tempting me. When in reality, maybe Satan is the one that's tempting you. And, uh, and so James first says, embrace the trials and tests, but resist temptation. And he's saying, don't blame God when, when, when you're being tempted. Uh, we live in a culture, unfortunately, that uh, we become pretty proficient at, at blaming somebody else. We blame our parents. Well, it all comes back to the way that, that I was raised. Or we'll blame God. And, you know, I can't believe that God would, would let me down. Or we blame society. Uh, you know, can you believe what, what our culture has done to us? And, and I love the way the message, which is a paraphrase, it's not a translation, but I love the way the message paraphrases Proverbs 19 and verse 3. It says, quote, People ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? And when I read that in that particular uh, paraphrase, I thought, well, that, that really is kind of the heart and soul of the issue, isn't it? The problem is not our external circumstances, uh, but it's our internal desires. And, and through the course of this, uh, of this uh, passage, James uses some, some really interesting uh, imagery. Verse 14, for instance, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Now that term dragged away is a hunting term. It, was, uh, it would be like taking food and setting it out or trying to uh, you know, attract some animal on, on a, into, a, into, a, into a, a trap. In fact, that term dragged away literally meant to be enticed by a bait. And then he says, you know, he changes the terminology. Uh, he, he knew his audience pretty well. And uh, he goes from a hunting term to a fishing term. And he uses that, tor that term lured. Uh, you think of a lure that, that, when you're, that you use when you're fishing. Uh, a lure looks good on the outside, but there's always a hook on the inside. Uh, this, this weekend, the Bassmasters, of course, is there in Gunnersville, and we look at all of the boats and the, uh, the equipment and everything, and I think about those fish there at, in the, uh, at Lake Gunnersville that by the end of this tournament today, uh, I'm thinking, okay, those fish have, have, you know, sitting there in the water, and they've seen all kinds of bait and all kinds of lures uh, that, that you could imagine, but there's always that one that's going to work. There's always going to be that one that's going to catch them. And, and I think that's what James is telling us, that Satan is that way. J Satan knows the kind of bait. He knows the kind of lure that, uh, that's going to attract you. And, and then, he, you know, he, he goes on to this, to this point, and he said, look, uh, desire has conceived. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Satan knows what our weaknesses are. And, and, and uh, he doesn't come at us when we're at our best and when, we're at our, when we feel our strongest. Uh, he, he comes at us when we're at our weakest point. One writer put it this way, his paraphrase of, of that verse, sin thrills and then it kills. It fascinates and then assassinates. And so James is saying, look, you've got to be aware of, of all three of these. You've got to be aware of, of, and it's interesting in English, they all three start with the same letter, trial, test, and temptation. Uh, and, it, you know, it's pretty easy to remember, but here's what, what, is, what is compelling to me about this, and you may, have not, you may not know this, but in the original language, in the Greek text, 
All three of those terms come from the same Greek word. You know, the word that we translate uh, trial, test, and temptation in the original language was all the same word. So how do we determine that? In your life, how do you determine what's a trial, what's a test, or what's a temptation? Well, it's all, it all has to be uh, in the context. So we, we have to look at the context to determine, okay, what, what is God trying to convey to me here? What's He saying? Uh, you know, it, it's not always a temptation. It might not be. Uh, it might be a test that you're going through. It might be a trial that you're having to endure. A and Satan deliberately will take that and, and turn it into sin. His purpose is, is so that you'll disobey God and that you'll become uh, weakened by that. And so he's going to set a trap. He's going to throw out some kind of uh, thing to lure you uh, in, into that arena. Uh, and there's a great verse, there's a great verse that I always remind myself of in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Uh, this is what it says, no temptation, same word as in James 1, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure. I don't want to end this this morning without looking at verse 12. Uh, we've talked about God's perspective. We've talked about God's help. And now we look at, at God's promise. You know, we, we've, we've looked at this from so many different uh, avenues. But James begins and ends this from the same context. Blessed is the one who, perceives, who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. What a promise. If we persevere, if we overcome, if we trust that God knows what He's doing, you know, if we can, can, can constantly remind ourselves to look at it from His perspective, if we'll receive and take the aid that He's offering us, then the results of that is, is this promise. And, and, and that's a tremendous promise. So, so we can't get distracted. We, we, can, we can become overwhelmed. We can let our present situation and we can let our circumstances uh, just seem insur insurmountable, but we remind ourselves that God is, is bigger and God is better, and God is stronger than any trial, any test, or any temptation that we'll, that we'll, ever, that we'll ever face. And I find that so compelling that, that through the course of, of, of this entire section, it's the same word. And, and we look at it differently because, here again, the context is going to decide whether or not what you're dealing with is a trial, or is it a test, or is it a temptation. In the original language, it really didn't matter. The solution was always the same. It was always coming back to allowing God uh, to, to step in and intervene. We're going to put a little, a little marker here because this time next week we're going to pick up right here uh, where, where we've left off in verse 12 of here, the first chapter of James. If you have an opportunity, go ahead and read ahead and we'll continue our study next week. I thank you for being a part of our study. Hope you took advantage of uh, enrolling in World Bible School. If not, call that number even after we're off the air, and they'll be glad to take your information. I thank you for being a part of our study. Look forward to being with you again next week. Until then, may God richly bless you. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ, a place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord.